societies. Mm. I see it, it emerges from human rights and it goes beyond that, creating more just societies. And here we are in 21st century and the world became more divisive. We have more wars, we have more exclusions, we have more migrants, you know, uh, people are migrating in search of better lives. We have more uh, child labor, we have more gender-related issues, and for me, inclusive education goes beyond disability. And it is, you know, uh, whatever makes your identity as a person, either that is your ethnicity, that's your culture, that's your language, that's your gender, that's your sexual orientation or your sexual choice, or is to do with your color, is to do with your religion. So inclusion is all about that. But looking at the world, I really have lost my hope, but maybe there is a hope. So can we be really inclusive? Now, in relation to this, specifically uh, focusing on inclusive education, there has been two recent books. One of those books' title was Inclusion is Dead. And in response to this, another book came out that said, no, inclusion is not dead, but it smells funny. <laughs> so why it smells funny, actually, maybe you know, this is what I really would like to touch on. When we look at literature around teacher education, for goodness sake, there is nothing new under the sun, actually. We all knew that um, we have to, when you look at the literature, there are four core dimensions that's been covered time and time again, including addressing barriers and structures <laughs> where um, um, the key role is the school leader's role, is the school leader's job to really address those barriers in communication, in collaboration with the rest of the education community, school community, and then uh, mobilizing existing resources, financial, human, and other resources mm. to somehow overcome such barriers. But as I said, as addressed by Professor um, Watal, there's hardly any training for principals to really uh, operate in inclusion. Now, um, let me give you a recent um, example from Kazakhstan. We had an in-service training for school principals in inclusive education. Then I found out this was only two weeks training. How much can you teach in two weeks? And how much of such teaching can be digested in such a way that people a school principal can go and really, you know, spread all this knowledge to their school professions, right? The teachers and other uh, education professionals. Now, I found that it was the school principals who was going to teach teachers how to do inclusion. All those school principals are not getting into classrooms and really teaching those kids. A big question mark. So, why we are aiming to uh, school principals and how uh, such training should be instrumentalized has to be questioned. Another big dimension, second big dimension in literature is on teacher-related variables, for example, uh, teacher attitudes. We have unending research publications on teachers' attitudes, teachers' beliefs, teachers' readiness on inclusion. And uh, the question is, we know the answer. When teachers have negative uh, attitudes, it's to do with lack of knowledge, lack of training, lack of exposure. So why are we go and explore this Time and time again, we know that this is very much linked to the quality of education that we are providing for our teachers, right? Yes. So why we are not trying to change how we are training our teachers? So um, actually this is uh, related to fourth dimension of what literature covers on inclusive education, which is teacher education what is really required to bring about change in teacher practices, so I'm not going to talk about that. And the third uh, major dimension is on curriculum and uh, structure, so we really try to find 
perfect pedagogies to train uh, children with diverse needs, right? <coughs> so anyway, let me just go and link all of this uh, with uh, existing teacher training. My colleague from uh, Columbia University will be talking on um, pre-service teacher training. <coughs> so my major argument, one of my major argument for best outcomes, we really have to uh, connect pre-service and in-service teacher training. Unless we do so, um, our chances of really uh, investing on good quality education is questionable. So, uh, I think that will be covered by uh, my colleagues. So I, I'm not going to say that much on this. Um, and you guys can ask me if you have why questions regarding to that. I got two more minutes, I suppose. Uh, my other point is, most of in-service teacher trainings are lasting a week. So my question is, you know nothing in a field and you're supposed to learn so much in a week in such a way that you're going to happily go to your school and start impl implementing this. Then we are talking about, you know, burnout teachers, stress teachers, teachers who are not happy, teachers are resisting not to work with such children, whoever those such children are. As I said, I'm not just referring to uh, pupils with disabilities. So in this sense, there's something essentially wrong. And we know that we have much longer trainings, but not in form of, you know, I am lecturing here and you guys are sitting there. That's, the, that's not the way to educate, especially not in 21st century. My colleagues were talking about technology, digital age, knowledge is out there. There's an ocean of knowledge where people can serve. We already have to do much more experiential, hands-on, practical, teaching uh, trainings, right? And one of the ways of doing this is through action research, which should last three to four, maybe five years. And for this, we need collaboration, teamwork, and transparency, uh, exchange of experiences, and we need, really, what we need is uh, collaboration, partnership between universities and schools. They are not two separate fields. And again, actually, my colleague will be uh, telling you how they are implementing this in Columbia University, hopefully. Uh, but anyway, I think since I got ready just little uh, time, I'm not able to cover everything. One, one thing that I really uh, want to say, I think, you know, um, based on most of the talks, my impression is that we see teachers as scapegoats. If education, if education is not given the so-called promise output, it's the fault of the teachers. How much are we investing in education? And how valuable is education profession is that needs to be questioned, right? Even at university level, higher education level, schools of education are the lowest of lowest, which really bothers me a lot because it's true schools of education, it's true teachers, it's true educators that we can change this world. <coughs> this is the only way forward. And I really don't like the idea that, you know, hardly any investment, we expect miracles. I'm sorry, we need resources. We need resources to train teachers. We need resources to create right environments for our kids and for our teachers. <coughs> So uh, I'm critical of those ideas, but of course you guys don't need to agree with me. These are my own opinions. So we need education is a key sector that has to be invested uh, significantly, right? So I'm gonna cut it here. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been a pretty incomplete talk, but thank you.